Hello, I'm Anne from Geek Life Luxembourg, and I'm here with Ian McDonald. Hello, Ian. Oh, how are you? I'm very good. How are you? Right, yeah. Um, I, I've just come, I've just done a reading, so I'm a little bit kind of ha. Ah, the, the the adrenaline is still in the system, so. So. Um, can you explain us what you do and who you are exactly? What What I do is I do as little as possible. No, I I am. Um, I'm a science fiction writer. I've done some fantasy, but it's mostly science fiction. Uh, I live in Northern Ireland, Ireland du Nord, uh, just outside Belfast. I've been writing for 30, 30 something years. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, and I, am, I am a full-time writer now. I, I worked in television for a number of years in program development. Uh, but but eventually you get to the stage where you can only think of so many ideas for cookery shows, but then you just think, oh no no, I, I can't do another cookery show. So I basically slid into full time writing. I've been writing full time since 2012. So I, and I, I and I haven't starved, and I still have a house, and I, st I still have a wife. So is that <laughs> so why did you actually stop uh, working in television? Um, I, I got into it through other stuff I'd done, um, through other writing stuff. I got com I got commissioned to write a TV movie um, way back in 1996. Uh, it was called Doom Watch. Uh, the idea was basically it was like the X Files, only about science and technology rather than UFOs and vampires. Uh, it was about the way that science can go wrong or, 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 or be a danger, and the Doomwatch team basically reined them in and kind of, kind of exposed these kind of abuses of science and technology. Um, they didn't want a TV writer; they wanted a science fiction writer. So they asked Ian Banks, and he was working on the Crow, Crow Road. They asked a guy called Jeff Noon, whose agent said he doesn't do television. And they asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. So we spent three years, we, we got a one-off TV movie out of it. It's still out there, it's still available, Doomwatch Winter Angel. Um, it's not bad. But from that, I kind of went into television, and I've worked with everything from documentary to lifestyle to animation to... Um, to uh, children's TV, and um, I worked with I worked with Sesame Workshop, and I was I was part of the team that brought Sesame Street to Northern Ireland, and we had our own Muppets made by the Jim Henson Creature Workshop. So, so I've I've worked a lot in lots of different areas of television, but as I said, at some point you get tired. Um, it's really hard, and I, my job was thinking up ideas for programs. And you get one in every 60 ideas. So you pick 60, you get one idea. And that gets, after a while, that, after a while, that gets really wearing and tiring. And, and, and eventually I just said, I'm out of ideas, guys. I can't think of any more. So I, you know, I, there were layoffs at the company. I said, you know, uh, let me go. And yeah, so I'm, I'm back writing full time. But it was fun. It was fun while it lasted. Uh, a, 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 an awful lot of fun. We made some good programs. <laughs> so, um, your very first story, how, how did you feel when you first published it? Oh, it was great. Um, you see, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a terribly lucky man. The first story I wrote, I sold to a local magazine. And the guy paid me in cash in a bar in Belfast. I shook my hand and said, there you are. And I bought a guitar with the money. And about a month later, I saw the magazine in a, in a shop. It was a proper magazine in a shop. And I went, there it is, you know, that's my story. Uh, and it was, it was, it's, the first story is really exciting. The first book is really exciting. And then after a while, it kind of wears off a bit. It's, it's that awful thing to say, but. No, but I guess you're very proud of your work. I, I, I absolutely am. Um, yeah, I. The funny thing is, I'm, I'm talking about a book I wrote last year. It's been out in the UK and America for about eight months, and, and I'm, I'm kind of my mind is in the middle of another project right now, and it's kind of odd going back to 
an old book. Um, I have to remind myself what happened in it. <laughs> Um, this actually happened in, in France at a festival called Utopial in Nantes. They'd reprinted an old book of mine from 1990. And I came straight off the train in to do a panel. And the guy asked me about the end of the book. And I went, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what happened. <laughs> that lost look. And look. He helped me out. But I, I had, yeah, I'd, when some. When, when a book is done, it's done, kind of, and I'm on to the next thing, so it's... it's you can't always focus on everything. That, that's it, yeah. It is, it's, it's a complete blank. So, you write a lot about India and Turkey and all these countries, but why the West? Uh, pardon, what was that? Uh, why no, what? Why because, it, because it's been overdone. Um, we always think that the future is going to be about... Americans, maybe Europeans, possibly Japanese, you know, that. But the thing is that everyone gets the future at the same time. As soon as you get your new iPhone, somebody in, somebody in Nigeria gets it, you know, somebody in Afghanistan gets it, somebody in, in Indonesia gets it. We all get technology at the same time. And we all do different things with them. And I was interested in taking, in looking at the places that science fiction doesn't look at and how they cope with our technology. Uh, our technology, no, with technology, with technology. No, it's not our, it's everyone's technology. It's everyone's technology, yeah. So I wrote, I wrote River of Gods, which was set in India in 2047. And I, 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 I because I'd never seen a big science fiction book about India. Uh, I wrote Brazil, which was set in Bra Brazil because I'd never seen a science fiction book about Brazil, and then I wrote The Dervish House, because I'd definitely never seen a science fiction book about Turkey. Um, and w whenever I wrote it, everyone said, oh, Turkey, you know, Turkey's never, Turkey's never gonna be a really important place. Yes, it has, <laughs> it is now, so. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, purely because we always, yeah, because the West has had enough science fiction, you know, it, I wanted to turn the attention somewhere else. Now there are writers from Malaysia, from India, from China, from Turkey as well. So it's so it's time for their voices to kind of be heard, and I've moved on somewhere else. So. Have you ever visited those countries? Oh yes. Oh yeah. I couldn't write about them if, if I, I couldn't write about them if I hadn't gone there. And I kind of felt I owe it to actually go there. Uh, you know, spend a bit of money there because I am basically using their culture. So, um, so I did feel it was incumbent on me to, to, to go, because if you go there, you see stuff or you pick up stuff that you don't get anywhere else. Yeah, uh, it's, it's little tiny details. So, yeah. What is your best memories from where the country you were in? I, I, mm. I've got, I, could, I can tell you real, I, I, I can say best memories, but I, I, I can tell you really shocking memories. Um, the thing about India is no matter how broad-minded you think you are, or how liberal your thoughts are, at some point you will see something that will rock your little world, that will turn it on its head. What happened in India was we went up to Nepal, to Kathmandu. It's a wonderful, wonderful country. And I do hope it's recovering from, from the earthquake. We went to a place called Pashpatanath, and that's the and that is where the holy river flows through Kathmandu, where bodies are burned and the ashes are tipped into the river. And we went there to watch, and there was a cremation there. They were cremating a body, and there was the family, and there was the son with his in white with his head shaved, and there was a little old little old lady wrapped in white, on this pile of wood. And there's the family, and a well-dressed young man with a, a vacuum flask, a thermos flask, comes up, bows, to, and has a word with the son and with the family, and they confer, and they nod to him. And he goes over, lifts the sheet, does something, pushes the sheet back, goes away with his vacuum flask, no, uh, nods again to the, um, the family, off he goes. And as we're watching, two, little, two red circles appeared over the eyes. What he was, he was a doctor. 
and he'd asked them, can I take the eyeballs? And they said, yes, you can. And he basically harvested her eyes. You know, and then uh, 30 seconds later, the son put the torch to the fire and off it went. And I went, I went, fuck me. <laughs> was, Incredible. Yeah, 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 that rocked my little world. Yeah, um, yeah, the, yeah. I, I'd seen I'd seen dead bodies and stuff in India, but that just was then, wow, that's a completely alien world. To, to that was something very different. Very, very different. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. It's just those red circles. Really. <laughs> Whoa. Are you on? What are you working currently? I'm, I'm working on a. I'm working on the second book in a series. Um, it, it's a series called Luna. It's set on the moon in the near future. Um, I've written about developing economies on Earth, so I've just moved it off world to the moon. Um, the first book, uh, Lunar New Moon, be out in French from Denewell sometime this year and out in German as well sometime soon. Um, and it's good. It's um, Whenever I pitched it, because I'm old, I pitched it as Dallas, the old TV, so Dallas on the moon. Thanks, somebody got that, yeah, yeah, uh, Dallas on the moon. <laughs> um, other people say it's the Godfather on the moon, and other people say it's Game of Thrones on the moon. But basically, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's that. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's Why the moon? Because it's the new frontier, there is no law there. Um, there's only contract law. Uh, there's a new society growing up. It's, it's very, very capitalist and very commercial, but very individual at the same time. And also, I wanted a place where I could trap my characters. If you have trapped characters, if they're in a situation and they can't get out, that's always that's always good. That's always good for a story. You know, if you're up there with your deadly enemies and none of you can get away from each other. What are you going to do? Um, that was fun. Uh, it's it's good. It's it's good. It's it's good violent fun. It's a it's a family saga. It's a, yeah. on the moon with with really good cocktails. <laughs> what is your what is a tip you give to young writers? The first rule of writing is finish something. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Um, write a little bit every day. It doesn't have to be a lot. Even just what I call turning up for work. You open up your laptop and have a look at what you've written. You know, think think about it. Do a, do a tiny bit every day. Even if it's just three words, you've done something. You know that wasn't there before. Um, don't give up. There is a market out there. In some ways, it's harder. In some ways, it's easier. There are lots of online markets now. The problem is getting your work seen by other people. Uh, network with lots of people, but don't push your, don't push too hard. People want to respect you for what you've written rather than you, you marketing yourself. Uh, and and be happy with what you do because not everyone can do this. You know, it's it's. Um, lots of people. Everyone says, "Oh, I, oh, I have, oh, I have a book inside me," and in most people, that's where it should stay. You know, it's not a fair world. Not everyone can do this. If you can do it, nurture it, treasure it, and look after it, because it's 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 special. You have a very great power. You can you can create entire worlds inside people's minds. That's a great power. I, you know, it's it's a yeah, yeah it's a. Yeah, it's a privilege, you know. What is your life motto? Like a sentence you say, and that you're, you, you believe that is a good sentence. Oh, blimey, that's really difficult. Um, I, I, think, I, I think Monty Python said it best in the meaning of life, which is uh, try to be nice to each other and read a, and read a good book now and then, I think. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you. It's